Summoning America. Chapter 193, Fresh Air. Written by D. R. Doritos, M.D. It had been far too long since Emperor Marischal heard good tidings about the ongoing war against the Gravalka's empire. Time and again, he received reports of fleet destructions, each detailing minimal damage to the enemy while their own forces suffered grievously. That all changed when the Americans brought their fleets to bear in the Articus Theatre, and now, he felt ready to share the incredible news with the other members. The throne room's doors groaned open, admitting Lyage. Marischal eyed his adviser, noting the distinct crease between the elf's brows the meeting was about to begin. Your Majesty! Lyage kept his bow shallow, respecting the urgency. The Americans report technical issues with Ima and Agatha, they will be joining via Manicom. Marischal suppressed the urge to sneer. And here he thought his own people were prideful. Technical issues? Hardly. Those nations were simply mired in their archaic ways, steadfastly resisting progress. He was certain they had refused the Americans' offer to install advanced communication systems. Truth be told, the Holy Marishal Empire might have done the same, were it not for the impending storm that necessitated swift adaptation. See to securing the connections, he instructed Lyage. With a curt nod, Lyage departed to make the preparations, leaving Marishal alone with his thoughts. His eyes drifted to the broad window, surveying his capital city's glittering spires. Runepolis stood as the indomitable heart of his empire. The distant borders, where the Gravalkan's brutal invasion raged, seemed a world away from the radiant core of Runepolis. There had been a few alarms with Kartalpas and Junral, yet the invaders had never set foot in a single Marishal city. Mu, however. Reports from the Muan front painted a grim portrait two-fifths of the continent already conquered, strategic holdouts like Otaheite vulnerable to being outflanked. The American deployments would help shore up the defences, but Marischal knew the pattern all too well. Conflict raged all across Mu, with mounting sacrifices on all sides. The EDI was a temporary alliance formed out of necessity, but he knew that each realm would ultimately prioritize their own interests and the Gravalkan crisis was their first challenge. Would the Americans be any different? Their stakes in this war could not rival the desperation of the Muans, who faced annihilation. Could it be that they truly grasped the imperative of unity and minimal in fighting before the return of the Ravernal Empire? Without insight into their president's mind, he could only hope. Lyad returned, announcing that the council members were assembled. Marischal rose from his throne and proceeded through the palace corridors toward the grand conference chamber doors. Lyad walked a half pace ahead, smoothing his robes with a final, meticulous tug. With a slight inclination of his head, Marischal signaled the door wardens. They responded with crisp salutes before pushing open the massive doors. Inside, imported American displays were already connected, each depicting a conference room much like his own, filled with the faces of their respective leaders. As Marischal took his place at the head of the table, the other leaders rose briefly in respect. He acknowledged them with a curt nod and moved closer to the screens, scrutinizing the faces before him. Sinclair was the first to catch his attention. Among the gathered leaders, none bore the scars of conflict more visibly than the Mwan Prime Minister. Though he managed a courteous smile and a respectful nod, the spark of vitality had long fled his eyes. He moved like a weary spectre, driven by the mere echoes of diplomatic duty. The dark crescents beneath his eyes and the weary slump of his shoulders told a tale of relentless strain. It was as if he had abandoned any pretense of normalcy, acknowledging the futility of masking his despair. This was hardly surprising, given that his nation had weathered the fiercest onslaughts of the Gravalkan's merciless campaigns. In contrast, Krinta Vulcarin seemed the opposite. The Dragon King was one of the few people who truly understood the importance of maintaining their resources and cohesion to prepare for the true threat. This fact was also why each breath he took was accompanied by a burst of flames, and why there appeared to be claw marks on his table. The Gravalkans had not only declared war on Ima but had also slaughtered several of their esteemed plasma dragons, an act of profound dishonor that cut to the very core of Krinta's being. This affront transcended mere military loss, it was a deeply personal violation. 
Combined with what he knew of Volkerin's impatience with diplomacy, it was clear why he was raring to go, full of life and energy however malicious. The other attendees, from Agatha's Jaistula to the Central Kingdom's Ruvent Lorette and even the Parpaldian Republic's President Caios, all bore a mix of expressions, ranging from neutral poker faces to uncertainty and weariness. Regardless of what they thought, he was certain that the coming news would be a breath of fresh air to them. Lyad stepped in front of the camera, ensuring he was in the center of the screen. Honorable leaders and esteemed allies, I hereby call this session of the Elysian Defense Initiative to order. We are gathered today to review recent developments and coordinate our next steps in the war against the Gravalka's empire. Firstly, let us proceed with the roll call to confirm attendance. A clerk standing by the side of the room began calling out names, each representative acknowledging their presence with a simple, here. Prime Minister Sinclair of Mu. Here. King Volkerin of Ima. Present. President Kaios of the Parpaldian Republic. Here. President Lee of the United States of America. Here. And so on, until all attendees were accounted for. Thank you, Lyage continued. As you have all received the agenda beforehand, we will proceed without delay. Are there any additions or amendments to the agenda? The leaders glanced at the documents beside them, already prepared for the meeting. When no objections were raised, Lyage nodded. The agenda is approved as presented. We shall now proceed. Mirishal rose, feeling all eyes turned to him. Members of the Elysian Defense Initiative, we bring tidings of great significance from the Articus Theater. The Gravalka's empire has been decisively driven from the Articus Ocean by American forces, ensuring the security of our continent. This moment marks a crucial turning point in our campaign. We must now discuss how to seize this opportunity and further diminish the enemy's strength. He nodded to Lyage, who picked up, our first order of business is to address the details of this success and what it means for our efforts in Mu and the Great War effort as a whole. Secretary Hill, if you would. A black man on the American screen stepped forward, clearing his throat. Visual simulations and slides accompanied his report, filling the American screen. Members of the Elysian Defense Initiative, I will now provide an update on the situation in the Articus Ocean. Just days ago, Admiral Locklear and the 5th Fleet engaged the Gravalkan 3rd Conquest Fleet, led by Fleet Admiral Vostok. Despite the Gravalkan's attempts to employ new countermeasures, our advanced missiles proved decisive. We destroyed over 60% of their carriers, compelling Admiral Vostok to surrender. This victory follows closely on the heels of our recent success against Admiral Venstrom's second conquest fleet, which surrendered after losing a single carrier battlegroup to long-range missiles. Meanwhile, we've cleaned up the remains of the fourth conquest fleet near the Heitel region in the northern section of the Articus. These engagements have dealt a serious blow to the Gravalkan Navy's presence and prestige in the Articus Ocean. They have underestimated our resolve and our capabilities, and they have paid the price. Exempting their presence in the Conshal Islands and minor submarine packs, the Articus Ocean is now completely free of Gravalkan influence. As Secretary Hill delivered his report, Emperor Marischal studied the faces of his fellow EDI leaders. Prime Minister Sinclair, whose haggard appearance had soured over the past months as a result of the war's toll, seemed to sit a bit straighter in his chair. The Mwan leader's eyes held a glimmer of something that Marischal hadn't seen in a long time hope. It was a small change, but a significant one. The news of the U.S. victories had certainly sparked a renewed sense of possibility in the beleaguered Prime Minister. For the first time since the onset of the war, they now had the chance to go on the offensive and focus on reclaiming lost territory rather than mere survival. King Volkerin, on the other hand, seemed unsatisfied, like what the Americans accomplished wasn't enough. The Dragon King's claws dug into the armrests of his chair. There was blood in the water, and if Marischal knew that much, then Volkerin must sense so much more. He could only imagine the frustration Volkerin must have felt, knowing that the Gravalkans escaped justice by surrendering to the humanitarian Americans. 
he was sure of it, what Volcarin truly craved was swift and brutal retribution against the Gra Valkans. Marichal understood Volcarin's tempered rage, but it would be asking for too much. Whatever the Americans were doing was already exceptional, more than they could ever ask for. It would behove them not to interfere with their efforts, especially if said interference involved war crimes and the subsequent deterioration of relations with the Americans. As the secretary continued his briefing, Marischal found himself wondering about the impact of the war, and what would happen after. It was interesting that such a thought came up, planning for the aftermath like he already knew the outcome. Granted, the Americans did wipe out for conquest fleets while sustaining no damage at all. So, what would happen next? What should happen next? The Americans told him of the follies of their World War I. Reparations would certainly be demanded of the Gra Valkans, but he couldn't overlook the fact that their industries and infrastructure would be incredibly useful in their fight against the Anomrials should it ever happen and the Ravernals. He'd have to consult with the others on this matter another time. Secretary Hill continued his briefing, but we're not content to simply rest on our laurels. As I speak, the Seventh Fleet is on its way to establish a forward operating base in Otaheite and land a contingent of marines, in close cooperation with our Mwan allies. While the Seventh Fleet deploys the 31st Marine Expeditionary Unit, the Fifth Fleet will deploy its own 26th MEU. This base will greatly enhance our ability to monitor and respond to any further Gra Valkan aggression in the region. Over the next few weeks, we plan to reinforce our position with units from the 101st and 82nd Airborne, including armor elements and aircraft. Additional details are provided in the supplementary material alongside your agenda packets. Director Lyage, the floor is yours. Lyage nodded. Thank you, Secretary Hill, for your update. The US deployments in the Arctic's Ocean and Otaheite are much appreciated. He turned to the Mwan representative. General Seneville, we're all aware of the critical situation on the ground in Mu. Your forces have shown remarkable resilience against the Gra Valkan assault. Could you please brief us on the current state of the various fronts? Your insights will be crucial as we coordinate our next steps. With that, Lyage handed the floor to General Seneville. The Mwan commander rose to address the gathering. The room fell silent, all eyes on him as he prepared to deliver his report. American maps and animated visuals accompanied his words. Gentlemen, I'll not dally. The situation on the ground is critical. The Gra Valkans have made significant gains on multiple fronts, thanks in part to their mechanized units and paratroopers. In Dernsbury, they managed to secure the railway before our forces could sabotage it, allowing them to push deeper into the Malmond front. They are currently engaged with our defenders in the Malmond Mountains. On the Oster front, our forces are locked in a battle of attrition, and we are losing ground. The recent loss of Brilliard Heights and Verdum Field has put the Gra Valkans halfway to Michael. Without reinforcements, we'll be overrun by March. Seneville leaned forward slightly. His eyes were directed at a side screen rather than the camera, as if he was speaking to a specific faction likely the Americans. Our forces are overextended and in dire need of reinforcements and supplies. We cannot stress enough the importance of swift and decisive support from our allies. With a heavy sigh, he took a step back. I yield the floor. Director Lyage nodded. Thank you, General Seneville, for your report. He turned his attention to the assembly. The Americans' recent victory in the Arcticus Ocean has indeed shifted the momentum in our favor, but as General Seneville highlighted, our forces are stretched thin. Immediate reinforcement and resupply are critical. Lyage looked directly at the leaders, both present and remote. I now invite the members to discuss how we can best solidify our defenses in Mu and buy as much time as possible for the Americans. Your insights on logistics, troop deployments, and resource allocation are vital. He paused, then added, Grand Mage Maiskra, perhaps you could start with your assessment of Agatha's reinforcements.